My name is David Carmery. I'm the past president of the BC Educators for Distributed Learning. And uh, it's my privilege this morning to introduce and welcome Dwight Ballantyne. Uh, this is a young man I met last year during our inaugural online uh, conference. And I got to admit, he is probably one of the most patient presenters I've ever had the opportunity to introduce because if things could go awry, they did. And for those of us who participated last year, we were having it in partnership with the Kamloops Thompson Teachers Association. So there were challenges with cross. And as Randy pointed out at the beginning of the conference, there was some connectivity issues that we ran into. And Dwight, through it all, had that big smile and face going for us. So it's uh, once again, my pleasure to welcome Dwight to our online uh, conference. And uh, I'll just turn it over to you. All right. Uh, well, thanks for uh, having me, uh, teachers. I hope your morning is going great. Um, yeah, like uh, David said, I'm finally used to this, but yeah, we're going to get started. Um, uh, my name is Dwight Ballantyne. I grew up from Montreal Lake Cree Nation, Saskatchewan for 21 years. Um, yeah, till I had an opportunity to uh, move to BC for uh, a preparation schooling program. But there's a lot of stuff that was in between uh, my journey, but I'm gonna save that and I'll just uh, share my screen with you guys and we'll just dive right in because that, it explains everything that I've been doing since uh, my journey has started. So with all that being said, I wanna say thank you all for taking the time today to hear what I have to present. All right, we're gonna go, go now. Hello guys. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you all for uh, spending the time to hear my story today. And today we'll be talking about the invisible segment of Canada. Let's keep it going. Let's get it going. All right, introduction. Since I've been living in BC, coming, coming from a remote community, some people are unsure what to call me. We were called Indians because Christopher Columbus was convinced he had land in South Asia which is why us First Nations people get called Indians. Sometimes you will hear me refer to, refer to myself as a native. I'm actually First Nations. Another correct term would be Indigenous, which includes First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, all three of us in Canada. It's the introduction. I'm gonna show you a video about Canadian history. I put the video together and I want to put it in here. In 1881, the first Prime Minister of Canada, Sir John A. Macdonald, wanted to get settlers and a railway across the country. To make this happen, the government needed to get rid of the Indians who were in the way. At the same time, the bison were disappearing and we were being killed off in huge numbers by diseases brought by outsiders. Entire communities were freezing, sick, starving, and dying. The government took advantage of all of this and told us that if we moved where they wanted us to, they would make sure we had food, a place to live, and be given tools to farm. They made promises and called them treaties. We would still be able to practice our traditions and to hunt. They would look after us. Settlers arrived and were given our land. We were purposefully shoved aside, kept desperate and on the verge of elimination. The government formed the RCMP and they were dispatched to force us onto the small pieces of land that were assigned to us. Out of sight and out of mind, we had no options. We had no choice but to comply. Our names were changed and each of us were assigned a number so the government could keep track of who we were and where we were allowed to be. 
Most of the land was not fit to grow food, and we could not leave to hunt, so we relied on government Indian agents to bring us supplies. Pork backs, lard, flour, which was delivered once a month, sometimes rotting, and always just enough to barely keep us alive. To make sure different reserves couldn't communicate and to keep us contained, the government created the pass system. This meant we could only leave our reserve with written permission from the government Indian agent or we were punished. They made it illegal for us to sell anything that we were able to grow or hunt so we could not generate income. This was called the permit system. The government used other tools of assimilation like residential schools and the 60 scoop to keep us terrified, submissive, to erase our memories, traditions, teachings, and every aspect of who we were. They made our ceremonies and languages illegal. All of this put into motion the perfect setup for generations of poverty, government reliance, and control. All of these things were designed to keep us hidden away until we could be eliminated, to keep us invisible and obscure. And this went on for decades. And that is where I grew up, on one of those reserves. All right, well, yeah, that's where I grew up in one of those communities. As a First Nations person, I have Indian status. It's called a treaty card. My, <clears throat> my status number means I am a registered Indian according to the Indian Act and the number has been assigned to me by the federal government. A treaty card does allow me to live on reserve. And a fun fact for you, a treaty card expires every 10 years. So, that's an old, an old photo of my treaty card, but that's all I have. Let's keep it going. Alright, there are 2,500 reserves in Canada. The indigenous population is growing four times faster than the rest of Canada. And the fastest growing segment is indigenous youth and young adults living on in Canada. Stats Canada projects that the indigenous population will reach 2.5 million in less than 20 years. Yeah, those are some reserve pictures. There's also 977,000 First Nations people in Canada. 285,000 of those are 14 years old or younger. There are 600 schools on reserves in Canada. 60% of those schools only go to grade 9. So if a student wants to continue their education some reserve, in some reserves, they might have to leave their family or their entire community. This is one of the many contributing factors to low gradu graduation rates for Indigenous youth today. Only 4 out of 10 Indigenous youth will graduate high school by the age of 24. If they do graduate, that is. We'll expand on that a little later. Now, we'll be talking about basic human rights. First one is internet, water, shelter, clothing, and of course, food. The internet has become so important in our lives that it is now considered a basic human right. Over half of the remote reserves either have no access or it is so slow that it's almost pointless having it. The government of Canada said that they will have this fixed by the year 2030, nine years from now. This means we cannot operate a business from home that requires a computer or access medical services online or we can't take online courses. According to the Indian Act, housing is something that the federal government is responsible for for those living on reserve. In many cases, the money that is provided is not enough to build the number of houses that is needed. The houses built are also not designated to withstand the harsh weather of the north and there is often no money to make the repairs. As you can see, that's a res house. Majority of them tend to look the same. Mold is also a major factor. This means that families live in moldy houses and in some situations have 10 to 15 people living in a two bedroom and one bathroom house. It's quite common in the north or any reserve. Families living on reserve are seven times more likely to live in a crowded home than other Canadians which is true, I've seen it where I grew up. Another fact that most people are unaware of is that First Nations people cannot own a house on reserve. According to the Indian Act, the land is held in trust for the Crown by the federal government. True. We are the only people in Canada who cannot own a house other than kids on reserve. 
All right, let's get to some water. It's a major problem in Canada. There are 61 First Nations communities that have boil water advisories right now. Half of those communities have been like that for more than 10 years, even more. I want you to think about what you did this morning. You know, probably made coffee, had a shower, brushed your teeth, and didn't even think of those things. You know, that's what I did. I'm fortunate to have this life. You know, it's a problem for youth living in communities because they've been dealing with this majority of their lives. In some cases, their whole lives. Yeah, it's true, but let's keep it going. Most people take for granted the fact that they can just jump in their car and drive somewhere fairly close to get anything they need. You know, resources around here. Or that most people use the internet to order clothes or anything else to have it and it can be delivered to their door. And it just arrives within a day or two, maybe three. You know, opportunity still. So imagine if you had to travel hours just to buy food, clothes and a pair of socks. You know, it's sometimes five hours away. Yeah, so as you can see here, is a First Nation store prices compared to uh, Lower Mainland BC. You see a chunk of ham is almost 30 bucks on First Nations Reserve. In Lower Mainland it's almost 10 bucks. You know in my community I grew up on milk and cereal so it was a go-to for me as a kid. You can see the price, price for milk there and the price for milk here. So yeah that's just a little bit about the differences of where I grew up and where some other people grew up. And we took those photos actually and compared them. So that's very, it's a drastic change between the prices. So we put it on here to show you a little bit about what it's like to live in a reserve and what they have to pay for their food. All right, well, this is a picture of my community, Montreal Lake Cree Nation, picture taken in 1958. As you can see, the development, there's nothing, pretty much houses that all look the same. One little road there, a trail, if you say, as you can see, it's an old photo and there is no pavement, no sidewalks, no streetlights. I'm going to show you a video of what my community looks like right now. That's basically from Saskatoon to Montreal Lake, approximately three hours away. And it's 15 minutes off of the highway and it's on, on a grid road, as you can see. It's all woodland. It's up in the north. And we have a bunch of snow that comes in the wintertime. A lot of snow. Sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. But that's the main road going into my community. I'll show you where I spent most of my time growing up. Right there. It's the arena that I grew up playing hockey in. The needle store is where I had my first official job. I was very happy. We'll expand on that a little later on. We've got a band office where the chief and council come. A K-12 school, which my community is very fortunate for. Not many communities have that, have that kind of school. That was a health center that is soon to be an elder's lounge. And you can go back to the photo and as you can see all the houses tend to look the same. Some are a little bit different, but yeah, majority of them stay the same. And there is a bunch of boards on the windows. You know, it's all poverty. That's one thing majority of the First Nations communities in the north are have in common. A bunch of little kids growing up just living a res life. You know, that was me back in my day. I'll actually share a little story about that as the presentation goes on. Yeah, that's where my, my cousin lived. Spent a lot of time at that house, but yeah, that's a video of my community. Let's keep it going because we got some more stuff to talk about. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about welfare. Many people know what it is. Not many do. As you can see, in my community, we get $305 a month. All right, well, I want you to imagine that um, you know, all the bills that we have here. I've been living in BC for five years now and I noticed that everything is, everything is expensive. You know, you got cell phone, hydro, car insurance, food of course, and you can tack on any other bill. You know, it's expensive. We don't have those kind of bills in my reserve because we only get some majority of my community members are on welfare. 50% of my community members are. And they only get $305 a month. <clears throat> so they don't have the money to pay for all the bills that we have here, just certain bills, like power. That's pretty much the only bill. But we cannot own the house, so we don't have much stuff to pay for. But we also have to worry about the youth, like families have kids and they need to put food on the table for them. And living on $305 a month is not very much, so people tend to get creative in different ways. You know, as you can see in the middle there, 
this looks like a bottle, but that's actually called a maker in a, in a reserve. People buy alcohol, they go into the nearest town and they buy big bundles of alcohol and sell them for 20 bucks. Drugs, I'll actually show you what a maker looks like. That's basically what it looks like. Well, of course it's not alcohol, but it's just what it looks like. You guys are probably thinking I'm going to drink that. Well, it's apple juice. But anyways, drugs. I don't have any examples of drugs because I don't do drugs. And I was actually living on welfare when I turned 18. 18, I got my first welfare check. I wasn't really excited because I knew I wanted a job, so we'll expand on that as it goes on. All right, let's get to uh, some classes, school. As you can see, we got different types of classes here that everybody here can take in the urban setting, in the cities, of course, they have opportunities to do a bunch of stuff, different classes they may take. You know, in my community, we didn't have chemistry, physics, or culinary arts, you know, or whatever you, you guys call it here. We, we did have basic math, basic social studies, basic English and history. The history was wrong though. You know, we did have gym. Gym was my favorite. Well, of course, I played a lot of hockey, so it was my <clears throat> favorite class. One thing we did have was industrial arts. It was quite mandatory where I'm from. Reason is, it's because we do have a little bit development. My community builds approximately three to five houses a year. So those who are very motivated and happen to stay in school, not many do stay in school, but those who do graduate with an industrial arts credit, you know, you have a job opportunity to help build houses in the community. And that's a huge opportunity for people because it's a job, a stable job. Let's keep it going. One thing that my community actually did, I don't know if it requires a bunch, I'm not sure if other reserves did it, but my community did it certainly for us. You know, when you, when you hit grade six, that's when uh, <clears throat> you start getting student allowance. It's called junior high, grade six, grade seven, grade eight, etc., grade 12. When, you <clears throat> when you're in grade six, what the school staff in my community did to try make you stay in school is give you 20 bucks a month. You know, as you, as you get higher in school, you know, you get more money. So when you go to grade 12, you get maybe 80 to 100 bucks. But me growing up, I, I never really went to school very often. I struggled in school, I hated school, but you know what? I never got any student allowance because that was my fault mainly, but yeah, it's just something that they did for us to stay in school. And when I was in grade, when I was in grade 12, grade 11, high school, I, I already got a job, so it, that didn't matter to me. But that's a little fun fact. And some, I'll share a little bit of rest facts with you right now. As you can see on this page, teachers don't usually stay for so long talking about urban teachers who come into my community you know they don't stay too long because I don't know probably because a bunch of kids don't respect the teachers enough so they don't stay long I was actually part of that because yeah I used to disrespect white teachers you know you have nothing better to do in a res it's what you do as I got older <clears throat> you know I was in my teenage years trying to graduate but there was sometimes you don't see a point in graduating you know, we don't have the classes that are necessary for us to go to college or university. Most of me and my buddies never really talked about, you know, school or college because that's just, it's out of the picture for me. I didn't really graduate till I was 21. Reason is, it forced me to graduate. I needed to because I needed to graduate to move to BC so I could get some funding. And I had people who encouraged me, but there's one certain teacher that, you know, helped me out a lot. And I probably wouldn't be here without him, so I appreciate that. You know, a bunch of people in the community, they, they have people who push them. But there is some elders who had horrific experiences growing up. You know, they went to residential schools and, you know, they didn't have the best experience. So they don't encourage kids or their grandchildren to really go to school because they're afraid if they go to school that things might happen to them to what happened to them growing up. So it's like a very sad cycle. and. You know, that's, it is what it is. And back to Wi-Fi, we can't even get classes online. Maybe some reserves, but majority of the reserves, we can't. Yeah, those are just some res facts that I wanted to share because not many people know about this. But we can keep it going. What do you do for entertainment? Well, if you're from the city, you've obviously been to the movies, malls, bowling, you know. Opportunities, lots of fun stuff to do. 
You know, I'm going to share a story with, but with you about what I did growing up. We didn't have all this stuff, so we had to do stuff that made us feel good. First story is, you got to imagine it's a very hot day. I'm still a young kid. I used to hang around with my cousins, and we'd always get a bunch of us kids in the reserves to go swim. I did play a lot of road hockey and a bunch of ball hockey in the arena, but in the summertime, it's not really open. So we'd always go swimming. It was a hot spot for a bunch of us kids because there's nothing to do. We either bike around or we all bike down to the lake and we take a dip in the water. But I want you to know that there's a lot of drunks in, in my reserve and you know the hot spot for the drunks is to go to the lake or the beach. And they, they get reckless, careless and they don't care about where they throw their beer cans, bottles or who knows whatever they're doing. But anyways, I went swimming with my buddies and we all raced in. And we all took a dive. I remember as soon as I got up from the water, I cut myself. And I seen why I cut myself, and I picked up a broken beer glass. Yeah, and I was bleeding quite lots. Thankfully, somebody had some toilet paper and some, some tissue, uh, yeah, tissue and some tape. We use tape a lot for our bikes. Don't know why, but we do. It's what res kids do. So, yeah, I got out of the water, I was crying, and of course my friends were making fun of me, my cousins, but it was a hot day and I wanted to be around the kids at the time, so I stuck it out. Started swimming again because there was nothing better to do. The next story I want to share is me growing up playing road hockey. I used to play hockey a lot, and if the arena wasn't open, me and my buddies would pretty much play hockey on that road. That's the official road where we used to play. The picture on the left is pretty much where my hockey career began, playing hockey in a the basement, then went to the road. Sometimes we didn't have those goalie pads you see right there, or the glover or the blocker or the stick. You know, some kids were fortunate enough to get it, but sometimes they wouldn't be able to play hockey with us. So the rest of us had to be creative. We didn't have a hockey net, so we scrounged up whatever boards we could. Plywood, we'd lean it on a couple of chairs and we'd just tape it white tape, black tape, and we just make a square like a hockey net. We would actually go into our houses and use pillows. We use pillows, we put them on our legs, and we duct tape them, tape them, and just, that's what we use for goalie pads. You know, it was, it was cool for us. We wanted to be goalies, and you know what? What we used for a glover was pretty much just a baseball cap. You know, it could catch a, catch a ball. And as you can see, for the blocker, we didn't have blockers too much, but we did use like just an old hockey glove, pretty much a regular glove. So we did. We didn't have too many goalie sticks, so we we were left to use regular hockey sticks, and that's what we did. Most times we we didn't use a puck because it was too hard, and we didn't have the proper equipment to, of course. And we didn't want to use one of those orange balls because sometimes it's very cold and the ice uh, the ball freezes, and if you get shot, it stings your body. So. We had to be more creative. A bunch, one thing I want to share is that a bunch of us kids growing up, for some reason, always had holy socks. Socks are actually good for a bunch of reasons, but I'm not going to get into that. But for this story here, I'll tell you. I'll show you actually. As you can see, it's just a sock ball that I taped up to show you an example of what it looks like. You know, it's soft, handy, and it doesn't hurt when you get shot. So that's what we used. A bunch of our buddies, we just play, play for hours, days. You know, you, you, you get the you get the image. That's what we used to do. Those are just some personal stories that I wanted to share because you know when you're in a reserve, you have to be creative, and it's just the little things that matter. And that that's what mattered the most for me. It changed my life because it was hockey. We loved hockey. A bunch of kids loved hockey. Some more res facts for you. You well, you get the gist of this now. When when there's nothing to do, we all get bored. And when we get bored, there's nothing to do except play hockey. But if we're not doing anything, it's just boring. It's res life. Nothing to do. When you're in living in a res life, you know, you, you start to see things differently. Because you're trapped in a reserve, you grow up, and you start seeing people drunk on a road, you know, passed out in your house, or people acting weird. So when you're a little kid... Now, it tends to be normal when you grow up on a reserve. I'm sure people around here, they'd probably be like wondering what the hell is going on. But in the reserve, it's normal to us. So when we, it was normal to us, it didn't really change anything for us. It was just like reserve life. 
Actually, I started drinking at the age of 12, started doing drugs at the age of 12. You know, I, was, I, didn't, I wasn't in my right mind, and I was always the youngest out of my friend group. I liked to hang around with the older guys. I, I don't know why, but it was like that. So I did that. And, you know, I wasn't proud of it, but looking back, it, it, it was my experience. Doing drugs and vandalizing becomes the entertainment, which was for me. You've seen a bunch of houses that had boards on them. It's from us smashing them, you know. Nothing better to do, and it's poverty, and, you know, it's just, it is what it is. But actually, nowadays, it's getting much worse. Youth have no positive outlet, so they're turning towards gangs. Gangs in the near city, which is Prince Albert, and there's actually stabbings and shootings that happen more often than you really think. So yeah, kids have nothing to do, so they go near a city, and yeah, for power, money, you know, all that gang stuff, yeah, that's what happens. So it's slowly coming into our community. Sad but true, but you know, all we can do is focus on the future and hope for the best. All right, let's get into some jobs. Jobs that are available for young adults in Canada. Well, a bunch of pictures here, people working their jobs. One thing I noticed here is there's so many jobs. So many young people have cool jobs. They have this job. If they don't like this job, they can go to that job. And it's so easy because you just tell your boss saying, okay, I'm gonna put my two weeks in and you go try out another job. It gives you the opportunity to try different things you may or may not like. In my community, we didn't have too many job opportunities. We had, I only had like two of them in my life before I moved here. And we have this saying in the reserve that we don't choose we don't choose the job, the job chooses us. The reason I say that is because growing up I've never had too many opportunities. I did have an opportunity to become a youth leader. In the summertime, as I got older as a teenager, I applied to be a youth leader for a youth activity program. So I was happy I got that job because I got to be around the kids, got to play sports, hockey, soccer, dodgeball, you know, a bunch of stuff, activities. But the thing I didn't like about that most was it, it made me feel good for only two weeks because we only had that job for two weeks and you know it was very unfortunate. I would like that job so much if it was all year round I would be a youth leader but in a, re in a reserve it's not like that. So yeah I did that for two years when I was 17 and 18. Because I didn't want to live on welfare of course I tried to get a job. And as you can see this is me working as a gas jockey at the store. Not the best picture to represent myself or the store, but in a rest life, gotta have fun a little bit. I didn't, I didn't actually sniff the gas. It's all good. It's just for fun. I actually want to share a story how I got that job. So before I got that job, I only had all on my resume was a two week, a, a two week youth program. And when I knew that I when I knew I had that, those, all I had for the, my resume was that. I figured I wasn't going to get the job because I applied for the job and there was four other people who were older than me and more experienced and I believed that they were going to get the job more than me because I was the youngest one who applied for that job. So as the days went on I didn't really care and I think it was a welfare day. Me and my buddies go out and drinking and yeah, like alright let's go get some makers, let's go, let's go to a party, let's go meet some girls. So yeah we went to a house party and yeah night turned out we were going to different house parties and during that night we were all drinking you know four or five in the morning just going to house to house checking out parties and I've noticed that there's other people who applied for the job who were at these parties and I didn't think about it I thought maybe one of them might have gotten it but you know it was like a couple days after I applied so we stay up all night drinking it's like me and my buddies you gotta imagine it's very intoxicated drinking makers doing drugs not saying what kind of drug, but you know what? Drugs. Leave it at that. Stay up all night. Sun's coming up. 10 o'clock, 11, 12. As soon as 12 o'clock comes up, we're running out of alcohol. Some of the guys are getting hungry. And I remember somebody in a room saying, who wants to go for a walk, a walk to go get some more alcohol and some munchies for us? So me and my buddy put up our hand. We say, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. So we actually do go for a walk, maybe a half hour, 15, 20 minute walk from the house we were at. We go to the store, we heat up our, our subs that we got and we're eating some chips and we're just having a smoke just eating because we're hungry and yeah we we're about to go for a walk to go grab some makers and continue drinking that day. 
the funny thing was that while we were there, there was nobody around and the boss comes out, the boss who was working at the store, comes out and asks me, what are you doing, Goy? And I was like, not much, just eating. I didn't think about it, but I was trying to act sober. I don't know if he knew I was drunk or not. Maybe I was just, I don't even know. Point is, he asks me if I want to work. And when he asks me that, I get an anxiety because I know I'm drunk and I'm trying to stay sober. And I, I'm trying to think of a reason or basically an excuse to not work this day and work the next day. So I ask him like, oh, so when do you want me to start? And he tells me today. And I'm like, oh, all right, today. So I think about it for a good five minutes. Like, yeah, I'll think about it. And I thought about it. And I, it's not the way I wanted to get the job. But I felt like if I didn't take that opportunity to work that day intoxicated, then I probably wouldn't have the job. And I feel like I got that job because everybody else was drinking, like myself. But I was the only one available at that time, and I was young. So, yeah, that's how I got the job. I'm not proud of how I got it, but you know I got it. I was pretty proud with only having a two-week mentorship program on my resume. So as the days went on, people wondered why I got the job when there's more people. You know, I look back and I smile and say that I'm thankful and grateful because I got, I fluked out, I, I was lucky. So that's how, that, that's how I got the job. And, you know, I smartened up a little bit and I kept that job for two and a half years before I moved to BC. So yeah, that's how I got the job. Again, not the best way to represent myself or the store, but I was proud of that. Let's keep it going. How old were you when you got your driver's license? Well, first of all, there's a bunch of kids here in the city, Maple Ridge, you know, you have the opportunity to drive with their parents or guardians, you know, and they're driving around with L stickers behind the car. And they're like, I noticed that they're like sometimes 16, 17, 18, you know, like it's cool to see young kids get their drivers. I like that. One thing for me is I never got to have the opportunity because in my community, we don't have driver's instructors that come in. They come in once a year. If we're lucky, maybe twice. But I, my first time I applied for it, I was 17. And, you know, like I said, it's hard to get to your learners, so not many people in my community have licenses. So it's obviously the older people who get picked first. There's 20 people who get picked, and yeah, I didn't get picked. The older people did. So I turned 18, and I, wanted, I applied again. Same situation happened. I didn't get in. Other people got picked. So when I turned 19, I actually said, well, all right, I hope to get in. So when I turned 19, that's when I got in. Did the 30-day course, you know, an hour a day that's all they could do in reserve an hour a day and driving it up so after 30 days with all my learners i was very excited but as the days went on i realized that it's still frustrating because because in a reserve there's not many reliable cars most cars have broken taillights smashed windows dented you know it's they just don't have reliable vehicles unless you're you're in with chief and council and that's true it's not a joke that's true but yeah, so I had my learners and yeah, I wanted to get my learners and I didn't want to hire somebody to the nearest city because it cost 80 bucks. Sure, I did have a job, but you know what? I had to buy hockey sticks and hockey equipment and that stuff ain't cheap. You know, that's it's real and I didn't want to pay somebody 80 bucks just to go, go into PA to take my test. It's nonsense. I needed to play hockey. But I feel like if I stayed in the res, I eventually would have done that. My auntie didn't have her vehicle at the time, but you know, it, it's still a struggle for people. Over half the people who own a car on a reserve don't even have their licenses. Sometimes a vehicle is not even registered. It's a res life, that's what it is. But yeah, that's basically true. And you know, all you young kids watching this, you know, take advantage of your opportunities and dive right in. So let's continue. All right. Whew. If it is so bad, why don't we just leave? Well, that's something that we always get asked. I mean, I told you my whole situation, so you're probably wondering why we stay. Well, I'm breaking it down for you. I was fortunate enough to get a job. Majority of the people aren't. So if you don't have a job, you don't have life, life experience, nothing on your resume. So you can't go into the New York City and get a job. So yeah. And we have no job, you have to live on welfare. 
it's only three hundred five dollars a month so you're either paying a bill or for groceries and you don't even have money left when i was getting welfare my money went straight to alcohol you know it, it, it is what it is and i told you about my driving situation and yeah that I actually didn't get my driver's till I actually moved to BC. At 25 is when I got my first official full license. But for those who don't have the who, for those who don't have the opportunity to get their drivers or any of this stuff you see here, it leads to nowhere to go. So I want you to think before you ask somebody if it's so bad, why don't you just leave? Well, that's pretty much it. It's pretty much it. So much stuff to break down. So with all that being said, some of you guys are probably wondering, what did I do? Well, you probably already have an image of what I did. But I want to start off before we get into that. As a little kid, every every kid dreams big. You know, to be honest, I didn't even know what I wanted to be when I was a kid. I didn't know what I was going to do, you know, but as the years go on, like I said, things get normal. You start to see people drunk, see parties, you know, see fights, all that non all that stuff that you don't see around the cities. Unless you're in a very bad area that is. But in the reserve it happens almost every day, so you don't really see that. And when I started playing hockey, that's when actually actually everything switched for me. Because I never really went to the city too often. I would go with my mom and dad to get groceries and pay bills. That was my big adventure of the day when I was young. But when I started playing hockey, that's when it changed because we're playing minor hockey and I went to my first hockey tournament outside of the reserve, which is Prince Albert. And it was a hockey tournament. We're playing other reserves too around the surrounding areas. <clears throat> and that was a cool experience for me because you leave the reserve playing hockey and believe it or not, I never stayed in a hotel until that tournament. And when I was staying in that hotel, I, I thought it was so cool to be outside of the reserve and to just do what you love to do play hockey and that's it and you know having the experience of being outside and seeing prince albert looking back prince albert was a big deal for me when i was younger but as you get older it's just it's not a place you want to go so yeah that's pretty much experience that was my experience growing up and that changed my life it sparked a little something in me to know that it is possible to leave the reserve and i thought it was going to be hockey i actually want i wanted to uh try out for junior A or junior B growing up but that didn't happen for me because it's the lack of the resources and the lack of funds and I wasn't able to so I didn't I didn't go so during that time I spent most of my time playing hockey with the boys you know I did work I did go to school but we would go to tournaments still so that's uh, that was my life if I wasn't playing hockey or working you know I'd have days off on weekend I only worked three to four days a week you know, if I wanted to hang with the boys on a weekend, then I would. Go out drinking, as you can see, we're holding makers and, yeah, trying to look cool. Look like a fool now once I look back at it. But, yeah, the picture on the right is actually us. We won a hockey tournament in La Ronge. And it's so cool when you go play hockey in different places when you're from a reserve because you represent your reserve. And sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But if you do, and it's cool because a lot of people like to hang out with you, drink, and if you win if you win money from the hockey tournament, all the boys party. Get some makers, you already know, just party. And even if we lost, we still party, because, you know, we have to stay in hockey. Win or lose, we booze, so that's what we do. And yeah, just more, more fun times, makers, smokes, coolers, family, friends, living it up in the reds. What else were we supposed to do? It's what we do in a res. It's just what we do. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah. Anyways, as you can see, that's me just living it up. I mean, there's times I would get paid when I was working, and I I just didn't want to stay in a reserve, so I'd go stay with a couple of my cousins in Prince Albert, and, yeah, take pictures like that. You know, I could have used my money to buy some hockey gloves, hockey pucks, or hockey stick. Instead, sometimes I decided to treat the boys and spoil them, so that's what I did. And yeah, that's me trying to look cool. At that time, I thought it was cool, but yeah, looking back, yeah, that was me. That all changed, though, you know. 
was in February 2016. I caught my first flight from Saskatchewan to BC. And that was very cool, but it was scary, getting an anxiety. When I caught my first flight, I was so scared. I remember my stomach going upside down. And I knew I needed to do it because I wanted to leave my reserve. Not many people want to leave, but for me, personally, I, I wanted to leave. I just liked the idea of doing something different for my life. So I caught the plane and I knew I needed to be done. Left my family and my friends and everything I've ever known behind to move to BC. And when I landed in BC, it was actually a very cloudy day. So I didn't get to see those mountains. Landed in Abbotsford actually, like 40 minutes away from Maple Ridge. And I remember driving from uh, Abbotsford to Maple Ridge. There's so many windy roads in, in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And it's so flat and all the roads are straight. Yeah, yeah it's true. So yeah, I noticed all the curves and I noticed different, different kinds of trees, different colors. It was so bright, so beautiful. It was so rich of color and scenery. You know, the landscape was amazing. I didn't get to see the mountains, but it was the next day that it did it for me because the next day it was partly cloudy, sunny skies. You know, I actually got to see the Golden Ears Mountains and I was so overwhelmed and I was so shocked that I'm actually in BC and I actually get to see the mountains. So when I seen the mountains, I was so overwhelmed and I was like, so I was like, wow, this is so cool. I want to climb a mountain now because I've seen it. Now, that's what did it for me. When I first moved here, I was so excited. I was taking a lot of pictures, you know. You get here, I take a picture of myself. And I don't even know why I did it because I just wanted to show myself in BC. And then when I moved here, I started playing hockey, going to school, getting a part-time job. I was working at Walmart. So it was cool for me. I loved my first year here. It was so cool, I was just meeting friends, playing hockey, living life, living the life that I've never had for 21 years. I just fell in love with it. And then I was going to the gym because I wanted to get in shape, you know? And I knew I needed to stay out here for more than one year. So after that one year, I remember I posted that picture on the left on Facebook. And then a year goes by. And you know how you go on Facebook and get memories from the past years? Yeah, that, that's what happened. I seen that and I didn't realize how much I've outgrown myself because the picture on the right was exactly one year. It's like one year difference. And that blew my mind because it's crazy to know that one opportunity can actually change your life. It changed my life and that's living proof. Like, you know, I'm still working out, but that was a huge eye opener for me. And that's when I knew I didn't want to go back to my reserve. You know, I had these doubts where I thought I was going to go back because I missed family. But you know what? I stuck it out because I wanted this life. I wanted to live in BC, land of opportunity. So yeah, I want to show you what happened a couple of years later after that. video was taken in 2019 a couple years back but that was actually a video of me going to Amsterdam overseas in Europe to play hockey to play an international hockey tournament for Team Canada I hang on to that video and that experience because it's a big deal for me because where I come from not many people get the opportunity that I have you know people don't like leaving reserve I for one wanted to leave and it makes me know that not every res guy in the reserve gets to go to Europe play hockey for Team Canada. I mean, that's, that, that's, it's out of my mind, but you know, it's the opportunity and the willingness to get myself where I need to be. It's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of disappointment sometimes, but there's a lot of rewards behind that. And I hang on to that because that was my biggest moment. And when, it was actually when I came back from Europe, that's what changed my life because I was on plane and, you know, I needed to do something. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I did. The reason for that is when you're in a reserve, for me growing up in a reserve, it's, you know, sure, I was motivated. I got got to work, school, you know, 
But for so many other people, including myself, there comes a point where you actually don't even want to graduate or even get a job because you know that you're stuck there. Like literally stuck. It's remote. There comes a point where you realize what is the point. So there's times I've felt so hopeless, so depressed, just because of the situation. You know, you want to do a bunch of stuff. You see a bunch of young kids in cities doing whatever they, they, they get to do for fun or for opportunities, you know? Me being in a reserve, seeing stuff on social media, seeing other kids have fun, makes you realize that I'm not going to get to have that fun because I'm stuck in a reserve. And you're not getting any younger, so you tend to drink more because you can't go to school after you're 21. It's true, and you know... If I didn't have that little bit of hope in me to strive a little harder to get myself to where I was, you know, I never would have, never would have been here in the first place. But because it's true, I speak for many people on that because it, it's, it's a hopeless situation sometimes. I actually want to introduce you to uh, <clears throat> somebody who was actually in that situation, like myself growing up. But he's here now. I want to show you a video of him. I want to introduce you to my cousin Vance. He is 28, and we grew up together in Montreal Lake Cree Nation. Vance is five out of nine siblings, but not everyone lived together. I went to live at his house at seven years old when my parents split up, and we share some of the same memories. We lived in the house by the lake. We were young kids running around, swimming, and having lots of fun with the other children. We also share other memories, like being locked in a room so our parents could party all night. We remember having to get ourselves to school and coming home to an empty house. Vance quit school in grade six. He is a really smart guy and that was actually part of the problem. He was bored in school because the only classes at school were really basic English, math and social studies. Even worse than the boredom was the bullying and so eventually he just stopped going. He stayed home and played video games or watched TV. He did try going back to school five times, usually at the start of every school year, but he would only last a few weeks, and nothing had changed. When he was 20, he went back to school one last time, and when he was 21, he graduated. Only three of his siblings have graduated, and only one left the reserve. Just like so many people, most of them get caught up in the cycle of drinking and drugs. His older brother Vince, who he loved so much, committed suicide. One of his brothers went to jail. After Vance graduated, there were no jobs, so he ended up back on the couch playing video games. He didn't have a driver's license and lived on a welfare of $305 a month. And as the years passed, nothing had changed. Last summer, Vance came to visit me in BC and he decided he wanted to stay. I know how hard that decision is. If you are not from a remote reserve, you would have no idea how hard it actually is. Here is what Vance has done since he arrived. He turned our rec room into our temporary bachelor pad and started to collect furniture and other things he will need for his own apartment. He has been to the dentist so many times and he got new glasses. He studied for his drone pilot license, which was full of math he didn't know, and only after two days he took the test and he passed. Now he has been making videos with footage from the drone. He opened up a savings account and bought himself some new clothes. He has been going to the gym five to six days a week and is feeling healthier and stronger. He has tried a bunch of new food like cauliflower, beets, asparagus, crab and prawns. He bought a second-hand guitar and has been learning how to play. He went hiking with me in the mountains and explored the city by himself. He is applying for jobs and the thing that he is most excited about is that he got his learner's license. Vance has done so much and he's not letting me tell his story because he wants the attention. He actually hates the attention but he is willing to let me tell his story because maybe someone who is almost 30 and living in a remote reserve will hear this and to let them know to not give up and because everyone else needs to know that he wasn't sitting on the couch because that was all he wanted 
It was because he had no way to do anything else. He had no opportunity or the support to make such a huge change for himself. It's my cousin Vance, you know, actually he just got a job now. He's been, yeah, it's working now. So one opportunity, you know, change my life. I'm happy that I can be there to help change his. And I, I honestly can't wait to see what he's going to be doing as the years go on because not everybody gets this opportunity. So with all that being said, I want to say thank you all for taking the time to hear my story and hear the invisible segment of Canada. Well, Dwight, I don't know where to begin because <laughs> that is so powerful. That is quite different than the one that you had last year. And I really appreciate your willingness to put you in the forefront of your story. And uh, I think it's, it's tough as an educator, as a dad, as a member of my community, to hear about the sadness that happens in communities around us. And... That's why I'm so excited about your project and what it is that you're doing, because you do bring hope. And just hearing your story is inspiring to me. And I know that we have sort of a limited time because I think this is over at 1030 because another one starts. So, Del, what do you want to do? Do you want to just um, have Dwight answer some of the maybe the questions on the chat? I know that uh, I think as was mentioned at the beginning, um, May 7th, we have a FUP who will be joining us to continue this conversation. So um, those who may need to leave, uh, just be aware of that. And those who can stay, um, we can just continue on with the conversation. Thank you, David. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Delia. I'm a part of the Ballantine Project and just want to welcome everyone here and thank you for being here. And Dwight is available to answer some of your questions. And one of the things that I've learned on my journey and being part of this is that, you know, these are safe places and the great places um, to be asking questions and to be having these conversations because the more we know, the more we can talk about it um, with knowledge and congruence. And so feel free to jump on a video and share your voice and ask a question. Um, or if you'd like, you can post the question into the chat box and I can read it out and share that for Dwight to answer. Thank you very much, Delia. Fantastic job. <laughs> Well, if you guys have any uh, questions, I'm free to answer. And like Delia said, it's a safe space. And I'm here, I'll be here to answer questions to the best of my ability and what I think about my own personal perspective and do my best to share what I know. Yeah, so we have a question through the chat and um, it's coming from Christy. So thank you, Christy. Um, just wondering how we can help youth and First Nations um, without being what some would term as a white savior. Um, so I think, you know, in white people in communities wanting to come in and help, what do you feel would be the best approach for us in offering that help? Well, uh, I would say from my perspective is, uh, well, today today's the first step to understand what an Indigenous youth is going through, right? Understand uh, the struggles, and the barriers that they go through. Because, uh, you know, when I first came here, like, I didn't know what to expect, too. And, you know, as a, we come from the reserve, you know, like I said, I used to disrespect white people. But, you know, there is actually good white people out there. And I would say, you know, just listen to uh, what they have, listen to their story, and just don't judge. Because every youth obviously goes through a a lot of internal issues on reserve and you know not many are willing to speak about it so 
when I talk about my presentation, I feel vulnerable because I'm literally sharing my life. So, I mean, this is the first step to share, share the awareness, um, unlearn uh, the history that, that was the white polished history and I know do some research for yourself on indigenous history and go from there. I mean, that's the best of my ability that I could answer that, but you know, just this is a first step to being aware of what's really going on for those youth living on these reserves. So, I mean, just listen to them and yeah, they'll open up to you when, when they're ready to. Great. There's another question from Molly, but I believe your answer to that last question helps to answer, um, you know, how we can do this, how we can um, be the drivers of change. So I, I do believe you answered that um, in your last question. Hmm. All right, yeah. Also, um, <clears throat> just to add a little more about what I, to, to that question and answer, um, you know, I often get asked um, how can like, because as I still, I'm only 26 still, so people ask me why or how we can help uh, Indigenous youth on reserve. But, you know, my, my, real, my real explanation is that my job is to raise the awareness of what's going on. You know, I can't help from the inside, but from my, from my understanding, what I know is I can only explain from what I can share because not many people know about these situations in remote communities because it's, I call it the invisible segment of Canada for a reason because not many people know this stuff. And when I talk to new people around here, they're, they're unaware. So, I mean, all I can say to that is, you know, just for myself is all I can do is uh, raise the awareness because I can't help on the inside. But as long as I'm sharing, spreading the awareness of what's really going on in Canada, then I feel like the more people that are aware, we can all work together to fix these problems in the future. But, you know, it's a process. It's a long road to get to where we want to be because it's been a, it's a lot of uh, dark history behind this colonization stuff that's going on in Canada. So for me, this is the best way that I could make people aware of what's really going on that in Canada. So I just wanted to add to that a little more. Yeah, thank you. So I have another question um, from Julie. Could you explain about the Ballantyne Project? Oh, all right. Well, the Ballantyne Project is about raising awareness uh, to those living on remote reserves. And yeah, that's pretty much all it's about. And I've been doing presentations uh, talking about what's going on. So that's what the Ballantyne Project is. We also have a We See You campaign that's separate and it's a platform for those who want to get involved in the conversation to, to know what's really going on because the Ballantyne Project is me doing what I'm doing right now, but we have a separate, separate entity to that that's called the We See You campaign. And that's a platform where, you know, allies can come together as one and, and be able to uh, spread the awareness a lot more. So there's two aspects of the Ballantyne Project. Great. Um, and I can share as well, I'll type in the chat box, the website. So anyone that is interested can go on to the website and learn more and to stay up to date on projects and um, the We See You uh, Day campaign. Um, so another question for you, Dwight, um, and maybe this has kind of been answered, but more specifically, how can people you know, reach out or make an impact and help youth on remote reserves. Um. I mean, that's the part that kind of where I get stumped as well, because um, if you don't have a relationship with a, let's say a reserve, you know, like as a white person, like coming from experience when people used to do presentations about uh, when I, well, in my reserve, when you know, we used to have college people come do uh, presentations about going to school. And like, I thought that was pretty dumb because how are you gonna get somebody to graduate when, when I barely even graduated myself? So, I mean, that was very like, we didn't, we didn't care about who was coming in. So if you don't have a relationship with somebody on the inside of the community, then it'll be a lot harder to get in. But like I said, like sometimes for me, I can't do the work inside 
the only thing that I can do from being on the outside now is from my understanding of being in a remote reserve to an urban setting. It's more of like, I can't, because I can't go into these reserves anymore due to COVID. And even besides the fact is that you have to just be aware and spread the awareness to share with one another, because that at the end of the day, it's a long road ahead and we just got to keep moving forward to the awareness to let, to let these issues really known, if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, this question is from Sandra. What would you like to see in the future? Uh, that's a very, uh, I don't know. I mean, I would like to see more relationships between uh, First Nations people and, you know, white people working together as one to let the truth be known, like, to this day and age, like, it's still not still not told like some people are aware of it but majority of some of the schools that i present to they're they're very unaware and it just goes to show that the history that's been written in the school curriculum it's like that's not even the real history so i mean yeah i don't even know i just the building the relationships and pretty much coming together as one you know that'll be like tr real truth uh truth and reconciliation in itself but that's a bit that's like a that's a huge thing to tackle, but for me, my perspective, I would love to see more uh, relationships between First Nations and, you know, white people, because there is a bunch of good white people out there, you know, it is, you know, back when I was in my reserve, I, you know, you leave the reserve, we, people are racist, so I, when I was in my reserve, I, I had this thing about, like, yeah, white people, you know, like, just stupid, but, you know, but as I left, I found out there, there is a bunch of, uh, good white people out there. Where I come from, I'm stuck on reserve, so all I see is natives. When I when I left, I didn't even see anybody who looked like me around here. So, you know, I met a bunch of young white people who are very aware and they're actually pretty cool. So, I mean, building those relationships, like um, it's good to know that I can do my part to educate them in a way because they're very, some people are closed-minded and they think of history as like school. I'm like, that, that's not even the real history. So I would say the relationship building and working with one another could, do a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, a question from Molly. Uh, do you do presentations for K, which is kindergarten, to grade 12 students? Uh, well, this presentation, I have two presentations, actually. Um, this presentation is geared towards uh, 13 and up. I also made a, a smaller presentation for uh, 13 and under. And it's only 20 minutes long. It's just very relatable stuff that, you know, from, it's not as raw as this one. So we have two presentations and you can uh, look on our website and you can get all the details on there because we have everything on there. But yeah, I have uh, two presentations that are geared towards high school students and to uh, 13 and under because this is too raw for some, some students. Yeah. So I don't see any other questions. And again, we welcome you to unmute yourself. Um, if you'd like to have a conversation, ask a question or even share um, things that you're learning or something that might've uh, impacted you or you learned uh, that was new from this presentation. Uh, Dwight, I need to leave to go to another room. However, I will be seeing you on Monday because you're going to be presenting to our local KTTA uh, Professional Development Day. Once again, to both of you, thank you so much. And also, we'll look forward to a continuing of this conversation um, on May 7th. Now, for those of folks who are in, this is uh, their Zoom room, so you can stay for as long as they'll let you. <laughs> we'll build relationships. Okay, you two, take care, and we'll Thank connect on Monday. Bye for now. Thank you. Um, we do have another question that popped up into the chat from uh, Leanne. Are you still in hockey? I, uh, yeah, I am, but due to the COVID uh, situation, uh, I can't play hockey right now. I actually just ordered myself some Mars blades, rollerblades to uh, skate skate on the road. So I've been going crazy without hockey. I kind of felt depressed in a way, not in a depressed, depressed way, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to know that if I don't play hockey, I get depressed. And so I bought myself some Mars blades and yeah, it passes the time. And yeah, that's the only thing I'm doing for hockey right now. But until then, once BC opens up, it's 
Uh, well, lightens up the restrictions, but it's hard time right now to tell when I'm going to play hockey again. But yeah, I still play hockey. Great. Okay, it looks like um, a lot of folks had to jump out, and there's just a handful of us here now. Um, but does anyone have any other questions or anything they'd like to share before we close out the room? Um, I, I was I was gone for about half an hour. I had a meeting, but um, I'm just I think it's great that you're a voice, and I really think the voice is needed. And so keep up the good work. And I'm just wondering, as Canadians, which means like us pasty white people and everyone else, what do we need to like, like, what do we need to get back from the indigenous way of life that you think would really help all Canadians? Oh, yeah. Can you rephrase that, please? <laughs> Well, it's just that there was a lot, I know there's a lot of good things that the Indigenous had in their culture and the Europeans just wiped that all out saying our way is better. And now that we're all Canadians all together, what sort of things from the Indigenous way of living do you think that we could all benefit from? Like I know one about living, um, like the recycling and, and, and living off the land is not always feasible, but there's a lot of good things about that. But what sort of traditions should be brought back? Oh, well, I mean, that's a big question. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Never got that kind of question before. I mean, yeah. Sorry, can you ask? I mean, I'm just trying to. Well, I, I just think yeah. the government, the government way, like the way of doing government and the smaller tribes and like being more, not so centralized and being more. Um, like smaller groupings, would that be a good way for Canadians to stay connected? Oh, okay. Well, with all that being said, I'd say just uh, be like, just um, like, I mean, this is the first step. I mean, understanding that there is a bunch of stuff that happened that's not untold. So I'd say be aware of the traditions and culture that has, you know, been, you know, pushed aside mm -hmm. and educate students of, pretty much what our traditional practices were. I mean, unfortunately, my, my mom has been into residential school, so I haven't been able to learn my language and my community. They just, we're st we still haven't had a powwow since a long time. So, I mean, for my perspective, I, I would say is, goes back to like unlearning what has been taught and, you know, do like for me, I, ha I have to do a lot of research to find some things out. I didn't know too much about Canadian history when I left my reserve until once I moved here, I kind of had to figure certain things out. So I would say, you know, from my perspective was probably just, you know, open yourself up to like researching uh, indigenous history and finding stuff that's been hidden, I guess you could say, and uh, sharing to your students or sharing to a friend or somebody you may know or somebody that's close to you. I mean, that's, pretty much a first step that somebody could do because I mean, I can't really answer that question, but mm -hmm. from the best of my ability, I mean, it's just be aware of what's really happening and dig a little bit deeper to find out the real truth and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I teach grades um, five and we're looking at residential schools and I've taught them that what they said was the indigenous look like a bunch of animals living in the bush and they decided to make them real people and they took away a whole culture. So my students are very interested in what that culture used to be and hopefully it's not completely lost i'd like well, to just oh sorry oh, boy, boy, boy. i was i was just going to add something to that sandra you know as a um white european woman who has gone through you know a number of years of unlearning what I'm listening, you know, I, I, I'm listening to many different Indigenous communities and people. And one of the things to remember is that Dwight's generation and a lot of, you know, the generations that came after residential uh, school survivors did not have access to their culture. They were not taught what that was. Their languages are lost. And so I'm seeing an insurgent of millennials, you know, younger generations that are trying to reclaim that. They're learning their language. They are trying to find the elders that 
still have that knowledge and are going to share that and talk about it openly and freely. Um, and there's been a number of documentaries. There's one in particular called Ayande that talks about um, trying to hold sacred these elders. And some of them are still afraid to talk about what their um, culture is and um, to bring that back into their communities. They still have that fear. So it's one of the things that was very eye-opening for me is you know, instead of asking, you know, what, what do we have to learn or know is just, um, I think what Dwight touched upon is the biggest key is the unlearning of what we were taught in, in schools, um, about what Canada is and, and what, um, you know, Indigenous First Nations people are and just unlearn, um, you know, the stories and really get the truth and come into that understanding that, um, we have to kind of build new bridges now. We have to, you know, help with building uh, the new cultures and bringing that back and helping to restore these things and to hold sacred the elders that still have that knowledge because they are um, at risk right now, especially with COVID. Um, so keeping them safe. So yeah, so that's just one of the things that I've uh, kind of come into and that awareness is that, yeah, a lot of that has um, you know, sadly been lost, so. Well, Dwight, um, I come from up north in Smithers, and um, my brother's still living up there, and he drives around a lot and has a lot of contact with different bands and stuff just because he delivers stuff. And he says that um, people are getting out of the trauma and starting to, like, they don't want to drink and just forget like their elders did. And they're, um, this next generation is having bigger families, and they're healthier families, and they have more family times. And I think that as us, we, as Euro, us European people have smaller families and the indigenous have larger families, you might get your land back. <laughs> oh, I hope that's the case. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, hopefully one day, but that's a long road ahead of us and goes back to uh, relationship building. But now we have a bunch of, a bunch more yeah I mean I can't I don't know what to say about that but that's funny <laughs> I hope one day we can or at least come to terms with an actual agreement instead of uh, trees being broken all the time I guess that's the the end of the road but yeah it's gonna take several generations before we get to that place but you know I mean I might I, that's a cool thing that <laughs> but yeah I mean coming to terms with uh, to a real agreement would be the key to anything, but that's a long way to go. A lot of people still are unaware and the government still breaks a bunch of promises. So, but at the end of the day, if we can, you know, come, come and come and agree with each other, then that would be the best place to be. Yeah. And I think you, um, you being a voice gives everyone hope, right? Like it does make a difference. And I do think that we are heading in the right direction, that we are teaching a different way. And that, yeah, maybe one day we can all be Canadians together and not traumatize each other so much as we have. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I fully agree with that. And I mean, I'd like to think that, well, you know, because where I'm from, um, I'm from a reserve. So I, I kind of, I, I sometimes don't realize my story until, you know, because I, I, I had to leave my family in order to become successful, which is why should any person have to do that? Yeah. But you no, know, I'd like to think that, you know, I'm somewhat of a voice. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on and I'm just like, just a drip going to the ocean. But I'd like to think that I'm doing the best that I can to uh, raise awareness in, uh, in my own story, in my own storytelling. But yeah. I'd like to think I am, but you know, it's hard to really know because I, I'm away from my reserve and I don't hear from my family too much, but you know, as long as I'm doing my part, it makes me know that I'm doing something. I'm not just sit, sitting back and let ev letting everything go by. It's like, I, I can only do my best and do my part. So I feel like. Well, yeah. I'm and if you, if nothing gets seen until the next generation or the next generation, at least you've started something, right? And that is a really good thing. And I guess you just need to have a lot of encouragement about that because, yeah, we're starting to see it. We're starting to teach it and things are changing and your voice makes a big difference 
because then we can point our kids at, look at this guy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Those are nice words. I mean, yeah, well, like you said, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can only do the best that I can. And, you know, it starts somewhere. And if, if nobody's going to like, here, I don't see anybody like who looks like me besides my cousin. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm so... I'm detached from my reserve now so I don't really have those relationships with them I actually some people don't like the work that I'm doing because it's back to the colonized way where we get put to a reserve and it's out trying to out Indian one another or it's like the crab in a bucket syndrome like oh this guy's doing good like no let's bring him back so there's a lot of lateral violence that goes on uh, leaving my reserve some some people don't like me but you know it's basically people I was very close to that don't like it but you know besides all that negative stuff going on over there you know I have to focus on positive because it's so easy to think about the negative and if I know I'm doing my part in Canadian history then you know I'll, I'll give myself a pat on the back because I'm not I'm not being a part of that anymore I need to I need to grow myself so this is one way for me to share my knowledge my story to uh, you know, educate one another in, in my own way, because um, I'm not a professional, I'm just a res guy, but you know, I like to share, share my story. Yeah, and one of the things to remember is that we all have the capacity to join in the action you know, little steps, holding our government accountable, you know, when they say they're going to provide clean drinking waters to, you know, put some pressure and write them and call them and ask why, you know, these things aren't being done. And this is how we kind of build those bridges and come together with um, our Indigenous relations to, to join them in their voice and join them in their fight and join them, um, you know, in these actions. And there's so much happening and there's so much for us to do. And yeah, sharing the, the knowledge and the history in classrooms is a step and, you know, holding school boards and companies and other organizations accountable to sharing the truth and not just making it optional, but making it, you know, mandatory part of the real curriculum and history. And that goes a long way. And that helps Dwight's ripple, his little drop, become that ocean wave um, where we're all in it together. And, um, you know, even myself, I felt helpless. What can I do? And, but I realized I have 20 years of marketing and communications and, you know, the rest is history. I've been with Dwight and his team, a uh, small team, I should say, <laughs> for almost a year now. So um, there's, there's so much we can do. There's, there's so much we can do and um, it all really, really, truly helps. So yeah. Does anyone have any other questions or things they want to share? I would, I would just like to say that uh, I heard about you through one of my students. I'm an online BL teacher with NICE on Vancouver Island. And one of, we have an e-portfolio platform where the kids submit their work. And when I first met this student, um, she submitted a whole bunch of photos and write up and told me all about the Valentine project. So that's how I learned about it. So it was really neat because I, I was looking at the curriculum saying, how can we incorporate stuff into the curriculum? And the kids, the kids are bringing it to me. So it's, it's very cool. And she had just discovered that she had a tea heritage and she was exploring that with her family too. So. Um, I do feel I can make a difference with the curriculum um, directly myself, like my colleague has uh, incorporated a whole bunch of um, knowledge about First Nations cedar tree. She's done a whole unit that she's incorporated into our course. So I see the kids are making the connections with, with the culture and, and we've got like videos we've uploaded of First Nations people explaining basket weaving and, and things that they did with the cedar so we try to incorporate first nations voice right because i don't want to be the person trying to say well this is this is, i want to have authentic resources and that's what i struggle with is how do we find those resources and those authentic because people need to share like you are doing white so that's part of the ripple right is that we're hearing your voice now and for so long we haven't heard your voice yeah, I agree. I agree. We agree on that. I mean, I mean, if you like, 
if you need like resources, you can go on to our web website and you can uh, purchase our presentation if that helps too, because I do, well, we okay. sell, well, it's all the details are on a website if you, if you need resources okay. because uh, we provide them. And yeah, I'm making videos of pretty much history in my own words, though. I'm not mm -hmm. my own words. So I'm um, yeah. learn from the government Canadian website page. And then, you know, I do my own version of, you know, what's been said and done, but you know, that's just in the works. That's just a little side thing that I'm doing. But if you need resources, you can go onto our website and purchase the presentation. Mm -hmm. There's also the Ballantine Project Facebook page. So a lot of what we're learning about or other educators, other Indigenous folks who are sharing and doing different things, we are also sharing that there. Um, so there's great knowledge uh, coming there. And for my own personal experience, just immersing yourself in these communities and really just listening um that's kind of been a huge impact on my own journey is just immersing myself um, in the various communities listening to them seeing what they're doing um, reading what they're doing watching their videos and um yeah it's it's you'll find the resources you definitely have to dig in for it but you'll find them yeah anything else you want to add Dwight before we close out for the morning oh i mean this is uh one of the most interesting conversations that i've had during my presentation so i want to say thank you all for the questions and you know um hopefully i gave you the best of my ability to from my perspective but you know these are definitely very good conversations and it, this is where it all starts this is where the relationship and the bridges begin spreading the awareness and you know this is probably one of the most interesting conversations so it you know, I'm happy with the outcome of it. And thank you for, for sharing what you guys had to offer too. You know, like when I do presentations, not many people are open to asking questions, but you know, this is, this is a good start to, you know, not trying to the appropriate stuff, you know, like this is, this is why, I, this is why I do this presentation because I'd like to open these conversations in a safe space and to let them know that, you know, we're, we all have to work together to get to where we want to be. And yeah, thank you very much for your time, everybody, you know, and um, yeah, thank you very much. And I appreciate this so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'm just All right, gonna... well, I... Oh, sorry, go ahead.